Welcome back to The Short Game. This is a show about short video games, games that respect your time. I am Reagan Kelly, and I am joined this week by all of my awesome co-hosts, plus a guest. Me, Nate Heininger. Laura Nash. Burgeoning birder, Shane Kelly. Oh, Lord. Already. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got a guest with us this week. And uh, I'll start by explaining that this week is a theme week. Uh, you, If you've been listening to The Short Game since way back in 2016, you know that we have occasionally toyed with the idea of doing theme weeks, and the first time we did that, and also the last, was... The most successful time we did it. Yes, was Bird Week in 2016, where we did a collection of bird-themed games. And so we're doing exactly that again. Lots of bird-themed games to talk about. And, well, who would be a better guest to have on the show than longtime friend of the show, Mark Bramhill, who... You may know him from his work on the Welcome to Macintosh podcast, but he's also the assistant producer of Bird Note, a daily two-minute radio show about the exciting life of birds. So <laughs> thank you, Mark, for joining us on this episode of the show, because it couldn't be a better pairing of guest and topic. Oh, yeah. I'm thrilled to be joining y'all. Yes. I, you know, it just... We have such commitment to our show and to our fans that we go out and we find the best special guests for this show. <laughs> we wanted someone deep in bird culture, deep under a deep understanding of birds. Uh, so, Mark, you know, I know uh, you've been really helpful on the Apple uh, episodes, but this one I think is where you're going to really soar. Oh, so yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ready to ready to spread my wings for this. So. Awesome. <laughs> I'm yes. so excited. And so listeners, as as you as you obviously know from our classic bird weeks of past, by which I mean the one specific time we've done this in the past, episode 74, way back in 2016, uh, we're going to be talking about a bunch of little games and all of them are united by the theme that you either play as or play very closely with a bird. And it's kind of a good year for bird games, believe it or not. <laughs> there have been a lot of them. And so we've actually got some pretty interesting, fun games to talk about. Um, before we do dig in, I did want to spend just a couple seconds. Uh, if you haven't listened to the show recently, you may not be aware that our show is now supported by Patreon. So listeners like you are supporting the show by going to patreon.com slash the short game. And uh, you can support us with as little as a dollar a month. We are really uh, appreciative of the help that we've gotten so far. Uh, the number one thing I wanted to mention about that, and we'll talk a little more about the Patreon at the end of the show. Don't want to tie up the beginning here. But the, the main thing I wanted to mention to you about that is that Patrons or supporters at any level get access to our Discord, which is the chat where we do all of the planning for this show, which means that you can get in on all of the bird puns, you can get in on all of the background discussions of games that we uh, are playing or are thinking about playing. It is the very best way to suggest games for the show because you can come in and chat with us about them. Um, and uh, we also have lots of great off-topic discussions. Uh, right now, we've got a really great uh, channel where we're uh, Shane and I and a bunch of our listeners are playing the new Fire Emblem and talking about that kind of too much. So uh, if any of that sounds fun to you, we are really excited to have folks joining us there. It's really been an interesting uh, community so far. I've been having a lot of fun with it www.patreon.com slash the short games where you can go to support us. And again, patrons at any level get access to our discord for chatting purposes. So this week we're talking about birds. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I, I just have to say, I, I, you know, the last one we did, I was, I was really busy. I, I wasn't able uh, to be on it. Time sort of flew past me, you know? Um, and frankly, it's been, pecking away at my heart oh God. ever since uh, that I was not on the last Bird Week episode. I, it's, it's been one of my biggest regrets. But now I'm here, I'm down, I'm ready to go, ready to fly. Let's talk about some bird games. Yes. So the very first bird game on our list, we're going to be uh, we're going to be moving through these fairly fast. The first one that we're going to talk about is appropriately called Feather. And I believe this one is out on the Nintendo Switch as well as on PC. And uh, Mark, I believe you played this one. Yeah, um, I did. I had to uh, borrow a friend's old, old Windows laptop uh, to be able to play it just because I do not have any PCs in the home. Uh, which involved numerous uh, crashes and errors and uh, trials and tribulations. But at the end of it, I was able to play the game. And it's an extremely zen, calming game, which was exactly what I needed after all of that. Nice. Um, so uh, it's a game where 
It's really beautiful. You play as uh, this, as a raptor soaring through the skies. You just fly around an island and explore. There's really not much more to it than that. It's just a very much, uh, it's very much a meditative game. Um, it's got some really nice music tracks that are calming and really nicely done. Um, and there's a lot of really nice details to it as well. Uh, when you soar into the water, then um, some of the times you'll come up and have caught a fish or whatever. Um, and just little little touches like that. I thought it was really well done. And the graphics are really beautiful too. Um, you know, if I had a PC that I regularly was using or if I had a Switch, um, I think it's definitely a nice sort of thing to play to relax or get out some stress, just calm down a little bit. But yeah, I thought it was really nice. You know, I think the whole appeal of playing games as a bird is to get that sort of, you know, flying away from everything. You, have, you look up at your at the birds flying across the sky and you think, ah, what a serene existence. And that's why I think we want to play as birds in games, right? Yeah. Not not for the not for the thrill of hunting down rabbits or whatever. So yeah, right. this this is uh, this looks like a lot of fun. I I love the the, the art style here. Um, yeah. And. I, I, in their in their description of the game, they, they really sort of hammer on the fact that this is a game with no enemies, no combats, no threats, just peaceful. F- oh, let me take that again. My damn phone. I thought this was on silent. It is on silent. <laughs> <laughs> just just peaceful notification sounds. Just peaceful notification sounds. A, we'll, uh, that we'll was such a in. beautiful transition. We'll yeah. keep it in. Um, this this very peaceful experience, and like that's what I want out of a bird game, right? Like, I, yeah. I mean, we talked like. I don't know, like it, last time we did a, a Bird Week uh, episode, we talked about uh, a game in which birds are dating, a game in which birds are murdered and accusing each other in courts of law, um, and a, a game in Common which- Common bird behavior. Yes, and a mm-hmm. game in which uh, birds are killing each other with shotguns. Um, so we were kind of missing this zen bird experience. Um, we Pretty lacked nice. naturalism last round. <laughs> yeah. Well, and we just did an episode on uh, Sky Children in the World of Tomorrow, and that game is all it's not about... That. It's the wrong title, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about, uh, like, that feeling of flying, right? We That game was originally going to be on this episode, and we decided to pull it, pull mm-hmm. it off. Um, I'm really glad that we uh, bumped that one up to being a full-on yeah. episode, yeah. because that game actually meant a lot to me. Whereas some of these bird games, I'm just like, okay, well, <laughs> whatever. What do it's you got mean? wings. Yeah, yeah. I, I gotta say, like, there are some things in this episode. The, the, the very last game we're gonna talk about, which I I will go ahead and mention now, a short hike, is a game that we could easily have done a whole episode on. So like, there's Absolutely. there's some of these games that are like a little bit lighter weight or a little bit more interesting or. It may feel like we're all just sort of throwing these out as little one-off weirdo things, but like there are some really great games here in this pile of bird-themed stuff. So, um, <laughs> yeah, Feather looks really great. I'm. Uh, I'll also mention that it is. Uh, it's not a very expensive game. It's nine ninety nine both on Steam for Windows and on the Nintendo Wii eShop. Or excuse me, I just say Wii eShop. <laughs> Where am I? Uh, it's been a, it's been a decade, Reagan. Um, the 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 Switch eShop. And you, but you surround yourself with retro games. I've been waiting for you to be like, well, you just get it on Sega Channel. I, I'm sorry. I mean, it's on. Uh, it's I on mean, I do. I do have two Wii's in the room with me and no <laughs> Nintendo Switch. So yes, that's that's yeah. actually that's accurate. Um, but yeah, it's it's out there on the eShop, and this seems like the kind of thing where like if you want to wind down at the end of a day, pull it out on a Switch. That'd be a really ideal kind of vibe. I wonder if some of these games were actually kind of clipping their wings a little bit be- <laughs> because they're bird games, you know? Like, we we don't do a lot of themed episodes for the short game. And so, you Yet. know, it, it's not, it it's there's no other kind of game, if you could call a bird game a kind of game. Uh, there's no subject matter for a game that we hit in this rapid fire way. So this is kind of an experimental format for us. Uh, and if you guys are out there listening and you're thinking, I mean, I would really like to hear them take uh, one of these games and, you know, like sit on it, incubate it, maybe hatch it out into a full length episode. <laughs> um, I would uh, I would love to hear about it, especially uh, if you tweet at us. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yes. And if you have a uh, 
if you have a different uh, non-bird theme that you think we should explore as well, we're open to that as well. Let us know. Um, so yeah, the, the the next game I wanted to talk about. Um, wait, so, wait, hold on, hold oh, on, wait, hold wait, on. wait, wait. <laughs> yes, we have very important. Mark, please. Uh, okay, oh, all right. Oh. <laughs> Bird facts. <laughs> yes, sorry. Thank you. Um, Listeners, exciting. Uh, uh, because we have a true <laughs> bird... <laughs> oh, God. Because we have a true bird expert with us on the show, we have decided to break up each segment, each game, with bird facts. So, Mark, please have at it. All right. Uh, bird fact. <laughs> Did you know that birds have been seen doing a behavior called anting? They will lay down in the dirt, spread their wings, and let ants crawl all over them. And it's Same. not totally known why they do this, but it's believed to be that uh, the formic acid from the ants uh, rubs off against them and helps control feather mites and other parasites. So it's kind of like a weird sort of spa treatment that they're doing. I'm uh, honestly shocked there isn't a gif of a bird doing this that's shown up on Twitter with someone just being yeah. like, same, yeah. big yeah. mood. Uh, <laughs> the thing big, about it is mood. it kind of just, it, uh, yeah, it it doesn't. It looks it like they're dead. Like, yeah, it kind of just looks like they're dead. <laughs> um, but they're not. They're doing this intentionally. Um, and uh, it's been apparently more than 250 species of birds have been seen doing this. That wow. is fascinating. That is a wa- that's Thank a wonderful you. bird fact. <laughs> that yeah. is a wonderful I, bird not, fact. Do I have any to say, of our games contain anting? No. no. I don't believe no. so. <laughs> I will also say that this is the best episode we've ever done. <laughs> so the next what game. What an impeccable fact. Oh, my God. <laughs> the next game on our list is uh, is Eagle Flight. So this is one that, you know, obviously uh, we've been we've been talking about wh- our listeners have been constantly asking us, when are you going to do another bird week episode? When's the next bird week? <laughs> when, when is bird week happening again? We are dying for more bird week. And every time literally that's come zero up, people <laughs> <laughs> no. have asked for this. Every, You're welcome was, listeners. If no. I asked for this, you mean there was, there have been two articles saying what's with all the bird games in 2019. <laughs> like there are trend articles going on. So they didn't, the zeitgeist was asking the for zeitgeist it. You were out front yeah. of this and, uh, in 2016. I would like everyone to know. Also, it's we don't make our address uh, really known other than online. So most of the people who want more Bird Week episodes prefer to communicate by homing pigeon. And we've not made it a great way for them to connect with us yet, which we will be remedying if you join our Patreon. Yes. So. <laughs> yes. So if, the... you, if you get our Patreon, you get Reagan's home address. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure his tiny um, child appreciates that. Um, uh, so, uh, so every time this has come up, of course, every time it's come up with listeners with, with, with among us, the first game that I thought of was, well, I've, I've had Eagle flight sitting on my PlayStation four, uh, since probably like 2017, and uh, Eagle Flight is a 2015 VR game. Um, I played it on PSVR. I think it's also on some of the other VR platforms uh, from Ubisoft, and uh, it made me very ill. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, <laughs> what, are we, what an interesting. Yeah, this was a launch title for the PSVR. Yeah, and um, I mean, it tries to deliver on the experience that everyone thinks that they want out of virtual reality, which is flying like a bird. Yeah, yeah. Uh, How does it live up to that, Paris, right? Exactly, yeah. Over Paris. Yeah, so like, I think Ubisoft did a couple of fairly smart things here. You know, obviously the, you know, um, the VR stuff was, was big and new and being Ubisoft, this is speculation on my part. I'm pretty sure I saw this in an article someplace, but I can't find it now to reference. So I, I think maybe I'm making this up, but I'm pretty sure this was just a matter of like somebody at Ubisoft, some internal team was like, hey, we've done a bunch of things like Assassin's Creed and shit, and we have just models of Paris let's just put people in a bird that you can fly around and boom, you've got a bird game, right? So like saved them all the time of having to create Paris. You are, uh, they, they've obviously touched it up a little bit. It's kind of a slightly like low poly version of Paris. And the vibe that they're going for here is like, this is after humans have gone extinct. And so Paris is overrun by elephants and monkeys and other animals that presumably escaped from the Paris zoo. Um, There's like, I don't know, 
gators in the water and it's weird. Sorry, I associate that with like the time when historically animals escaping from the Paris Zoo get eaten. So I, I don't really think of that as a like positive thing. Well, to I see think in game. this case, they're the ones that did the eating and all the humans are dead. Oh, okay. Yeah. And okay. Um, revenge. Yeah. Revenge. Finally. And uh, so you're the, the game is mostly sort of like a like a flying like flight trick kind of game. So there's different gameplay modes, but mostly what you're doing is sort of flying around Paris, uh, doing things like flying through rings or collecting collectibles like feathers and things like that. And also there's multiplayer modes that I didn't get a chance to engage with that I understand are kind of capture the flag ish. Um, so there's a couple of things about this game that are real weird. Uh, the first that I thought when I booted this game up the first time, I burst out laughing because you put on your headset, right? You boot up the game, the lights come up and you're in, you're in a kind of a soft void. And then there's a cracking sound and oh, it's oh, your you giant hatch. mother eagle and you hatch yes. out of the egg. <laughs> like, like there's this <laughs> massive eagle hovering above you and it's just this, it's just this horrifying presence and, and you hatch out of your egg. And, and then, the, the, then immediately after that, you notice, oh my word, I have this massive nose in front of my goggles. <laughs> this massive eagle, eagle nose, eagle. Shut uh, it down. Me. Shut it down. Why? I can't why? take the body horror. Why? Was, and, yeah, and like, why and like, like some surrounding it, shit right it, there. It really is. And like surrounding your view. Uh, this is sort of smart because one of the one of the distracting things about VR is that you have this very restrictive field of view. Well, this sets your restrictive field of view with like feathers around the outside. So it's like you full on feel like you've got this like. You're like this tiny head, but like surrounded by this like massive mascot head of a of a You're bird. You're like a tiny person inside a bird. <laughs> exactly. It's so goofy and weird. It's like dressing up as a mascot. It is. It is. <laughs> and so that part I was fine because I wasn't moving yet. But then, of course, immediately you start flying, and the and I was oh no, oh no, this is very bad because so I've I've played a lot of VR games and um, I'm not particularly motion sickness. Uh, prone. I know some people have more trouble with this than others. For me, the one thing that really sets off motion sickness in VR is smooth gliding motion. Because like if I, so things like, um, like uh, uh, Resident Evil, for example, the way they handle motion in that game is basically with these like little um, uh, snaps, you know, you, you move instantly from one point to another. Uh, you're actually always sort of standing still, but when you want to move, you're kind of like pointing where you want to go, snap, you're there. And it's kind of like blinking your eyes and suddenly you've moved and that no motion sickness whatsoever. But in um, in this game, you're smoothly gliding across Paris and it just like Why do you have to say it that oh, way every time. Oh, God, it, just, it made me so sick. Uh, I smooth. only played about an hour of this. I, I kept taking off my goggles, giving myself a little break, playing some more. I really wanted to get like enough out of this to like get a good picture of what this game was all about. Um, but I can I can definitely say that this is this is like. This is a real goofy, weird game. I don't have that much more to say about it other than like, oh, I don't I don't actually recommend it unless you really want the sort of free flying experience. There's not a lot of games that actually do that because it's so prone to motion sickness for so many people. But if you know that you're not prone to motion sickness in VR and you want a free flying experience, this does that pretty well. All of the all the controls are based on like where you point your head. So you do get that kind of like if I want to do a tight turn, I'm literally like craning my neck up into the side to kind of do a, <laughs> a like a tight bird turn or whatever. Um, and you know you're not using the the sticks on your on your controller at all. You're really just using the triggers to like speed up or slow down your flight. So it's it's got good controls. Um, the actual gameplay is fine if there if your main interest is I want to experience flying, and you know your main your main goals in that are like I want to fly through hoops. So um, yeah, overall it's fine. It's one of it's an okay game. It's got the goofiest <laughs> damn beginning but uh after you get past that it's fine it's a it's a you know fly through notre dame cathedral if you want it's cool if you want a um a plus uh vr flying game though check out ultra wings uh that's that's the good shit yeah that game was a that game was a little like better on my motion sickness for whatever reason i'm not really sure why the difference because they actually both well it helps that you're in a airplane Mm. that helps orient you i think that's a good point Um, yeah I'm going to be talking about a VR game as well, and um, it has actually terrific 
um, motion options. I think really that's the thing that games in VR really need at this point to be considered a A plus game is to have lots of options because everyone seems to respond to VR a little bit differently. And when it comes to movement, uh, being able to teleport or move in clicks or uh, move slowly or smoothly glide, there's lots of options that people should be able to be uh, to and choose whichever one uh, makes you the least likely to vomit uh, on your carpet while wearing a giant plastic headset. Yeah. <laughs> uh. um, speaking of vomit, the next game that we were going to talk about uh, is called Bird Gut. And uh, I, I haven't played this one, but I think Mark has. Wait, and before he starts, oh, bird fact. <laughs> How many do times do are we going to forget our most important <laughs> feature of the show? <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, bird fact. Did you know that the crested auklet, they're uh, small seabirds that nest on remote cliffs in the northern Pacific and the Bering Sea, they smell like tangerines during May season. <laughs> and this smell, uh, the experiments have shown that the females are more likely to go for the males that emit the stronger smell. So the more they smell like a tangerine, the the hotter they are, basically. Oh, my God. So that's that's uh, one of my favorite <laughs> little ones that I've learned lately. These are... <laughs> Some These hot tangerine stellar. smelling birds. That yeah, is a, that is a sexy, sexy bird fact. <laughs> <laughs> so going into the to least sexy facts. game. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, yes, the, the least sexy game on our list easily is Bird Gut. <laughs> uh, I was a little bit drawn to this because it's got a fun art style, but I didn't get around to actually giving this one a try. But I believe that you did, Mark. Sorry to punt it to you again, but uh, tell me about Bird Gut. Sure. I played it for a little bit. I did not get very far into it. Um, the aesthetic, uh, yeah, it's it's very cartoonish. Uh, just, I don't know. Do you have a, I don't know exactly how to describe it or what to compare it to. Uh, so I, I, my first comparison, and this is just because of the show that we do here, was to compare it a little bit to West of Loathing because it is this sort of mm, like yeah. um, black and white cartoonish art style with a sort of a simple line art not like not a lot of detail um yeah yeah very like uh i mean west of loathing is like if you've seen or played that game it it, yeah. it really is sort of in line with that aesthetic maybe just slightly more detailed than that but not a lot yeah it's it's very uh kind of done in a way that's meant to look lazy um mm. <laughs> and it's there's there's definitely a charm to that um where you play as a bug that is some weird messed up bee uh, that is uh, just like kind of kind of looks like a bean with eyes <laughs> um, and mysteriously and gets, two legs, a two legged yeah, bug, two legged bug, uh, which looks like a bean and uh, gets eaten by a bird. And then uh, you have to traverse your way through through the guts um, and, <laughs> you know, uh, it's weird and definitely over the top silly, which I, I'm a fan of that type of thing. I personally wasn't super into this game. Um, I think it's, it's something where it's okay puzzles and kind of trying to exp like, uh, get through various mazes and puzzles and stuff. But, uh, it, it didn't totally work for me, but, um, it also is something where, really going for the absurdist of uh, all the weird like boats and uh, uh, machinery that's inside this bird <laughs> um, uh, where it felt like it was definitely trying to be like Pixar's inside out, but about mm. the digestive tract, <laughs> um, uh, which, you know, there's, there, I can see what they were going for. It wasn't something that worked for me, but uh, I could see someone else enjoying it. I mean, it's got insanely positive Steam reviews. Um, I think it's got like a 94% or something. Yeah. Um, I think that, well, it's free to play. And it's yeah, also yeah, it, it helps I think a lot if you that watch it, is, the it is a trailer, free game. Uh, I mean, yeah, if you watch the trailer, you're like, oh, this is for me. Yeah, it's it, yeah. It, it is pretty immediately charming looking. I could see this uh, maybe getting tiresome if, for example, like some of these puzzles look a little fiddly or like you're, like yeah. it looks to me like you're going to have to be uh, executing on puzzles while also doing like action platforming and 
Um, you know, being in peril while trying to solve puzzles is always super fun. So I don't know. It, I, I I think I'd be much more willing to give this a shot because it's free. That's yeah, great. So if that's, <laughs> that's why I gave it a shot. Exactly. So if you're interested in sort of puzzle platformer style stuff with a kind of a humorous or comedic bent, like I can't see why you wouldn't want to give this at least a shot. It's free on Steam. And you have overwhelmingly positive reviews. So like, I'm sure that being free helps with that somewhat, but sometimes people leave pretty, pretty nasty reviews, uh, even on free stuff on Steam. So, hey, you know, I hate this free game. I know it's something really good. Yeah. Lots of the reviews (laughs) are saying I would I would have given this a positive review, even if it cost five dollars. And I'm like, wow, what a (laughs) princely sum. I can't believe (laughs) they'd be willing to pay up to and including five dollars for this video game that they enjoyed. I think we all need to go and review it badly on Steam just to <laughs> counteract the hype. Yeah, obviously. Ugh. I think, uh, real quick, shout out to Simple Beat who suggested this to us. Yeah, that's yes. right. This was suggested to us by one of our one of our friends on Discord. So probably the best way, listeners, if to get us to check out a game is to come on our Discord and chat with us about it. Much better than a and tweet. We'll give it a mixed review. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Sorry about that. No, it's give it us is. money so that we may not like your game. The creator of this game is not on our Discord. <laughs> yes. Well, the nice thing about Discord is that it's not you don't have to fit all of your thoughts about a game into a tweet. You can come on and have a conversation <sighs> with us about it. And that's exactly what we want. So if you mm-hmm. have the time and inclination, that is the best way to contact us with game suggestions. Um So bird gut, obviously pretty cool. But before we move on to our next bird game, we obviously need another bird fact. So take it away, Mark. All right. Bird fact. Uh, This is about how James Bond got his name. Um, Ian Fleming, the author, uh, was living in Jamaica at the time he was writing the first book in the series, uh, Casino Royale. And he secretly a bird. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> wow, that is a fun uh, fact he was he was an avid birder and uh he was trying to come up with a name for his character and he looked out over his bookshelf and saw the birds of the west indies written by ornithologist james bond uh and that's where he got the name and uh is named after a real life guy who studied birds for a living so fascinating (laughs) that's a that's another very good bird fact thank you very much and shane i believe a moment ago you were introducing another vr game that you played and i think laura also played this but not in vr no i played it normal style yes this is i mean this is a game that you can play in either uh vr or uh without a headset uh with a standard controller uh the game i played is called falcon age that came out uh, uh, in uh, April, yeah, 2019, yeah, yeah, back yeah in April. pretty recently. Actually, we got a lot of people asking us, "Hey, are you going to cover Falcon Age?" And it just didn't come together for us at the time. Um, but you know, of course, we just knew we were going to save it for Bird Week. Oh yeah, I, we've been sitting on this one. Uh, but the the thing about Falcon Age, um, I have tried it a little bit in VR and a little bit out. Right, so I, it's <laughs> it's nice to be able to play both in VR and not. Um, it's much, much, much better in VR. This mm. is a game that really feels like it's made for VR. Um, the the idea with Falcon Age is it's a first person game where uh, the lead character Ara is part of this sort of hunter gatherer society on this desert planet that is being taken over by robots, um, and it is kind of a anti colonial uh, message. To the game, you could call it real left wing stuff. Get it? <laughs> oh wing. Oh. Um, <laughs> oh, and okay. the, uh, the the game starts off with you in a uh, prison, and there's like a falcon that's like nesting on your uh, windowsill, uh, and you wind up adopting a baby falcon. A jailbird. It yeah. is a jailbird. <laughs> The it is. They've, there's jailbird. <laughs> Laura, did you did you like the baby falcon as much as I did? Oh, I did. I liked the baby falcon so much that when you have slowly raised this baby into its uh, full adult size, they immediately give you a hat you can put on it to put it back in the baby mode. And 
Uh, listener, I put the hat back on that bird and kept that bird in baby size the rest <laughs> of the game because I did not want to give up the cute baby bird. I've seen photos of this bird, and I can confirm oh, yeah. it is an extremely cute bird. So, oh. yes. So the thing about the bird, just about the game in general, is I'm on the record as absolutely loving virtual pets just in general. I I have uh, I, I have a saved search on eBay to try and snipe one of the good, more modern Tamagotchis. Um, <laughs> I... I just love things that let you have a pet in the game. I, I will play a Beastmaster Ranger in D&D, even though it is a suboptimal class. Uh, there are lots of reasons why I love uh, to have pets in my games. And this is probably one of the better video game pets just because of the real feeling of like, you know, hold your arm up to your face and press the trigger on the little uh on the uh, move controller and you whistle for the bird and it soars down and lands on your hand and it's it just feels really there and it does that wonderful thing of like you know you're moving your hand and you know birds you, oh, you yeah. move them and their head kind doesn't bird their neck head, yes. yeah mm-hmm. yeah doing the bird we neck all know thing. that um we all know we've all experienced bird neck of course so yeah that, that aspect of it is really really great um the game as a whole, I think, is pretty good. Uh, you know, it's worth spending a few hours with, but it is full of stuff that just does not matter. Uh, there's a whole hunting mechanic that did, you know, that is cool. It's really cool to send your bird off to fly off and hunt stuff, but it doesn't really do much except to get so- you meat. I will say that what that does is you get to see your bird grab a rabbit, throw it in the air, violently pounce on it, and murder, like, break the neck of that rabbit. And I don't think I'm a bloodthirsty person, but I thoroughly enjoyed watching my bird just murder weird (laughs) alien creatures all across the land. Um, But that leads into these systems. Like, like, there's, like, a cooking system. You feed them with the meat, but, like... Honestly, murdering those animals was very satisfying. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the combat in the game is pretty cool, actually. There's, um, you know, sending your bird off to actually do the fighting for you is is cool. And they you have um, equipped this sort of electrical baton with kind of a magnetic whip on it. And, you know, some of the enemies are weak to your attacks with the baton. Some of them are weak to the bird. Some of them have armor that you need to pull off with the magnetic whip um, before your bird can attack them. You can have your bird like come and pick them up and hold them upside down and you can beat the beat the enemies with your baton. So like this is a really fun game that kind of feels in a way like you've got like a player two playing along with you. Um, it is cool that you can like get these little toys and and like hats and <laughs> st- stupid uh, monocles and I shit mean, for your bird. Every there are so many stupid things you can do with this bird. It's it's really astonishing. Over half of the description for this game are just like things you can do with the bird. And so I've I talked about this in Wonder Song, but a dedicated button that just does fun shit is like the best thing of a game. Like Wonder Song, you could hit a button and dance. In this, you hit a button and it's apparently the soothe button, but it lets you high five the bird. You can put your Ooh. hands in a heart shape and if you had a baby bird, it'll stick its head through the heart. Oh, that's <laughs> and if good. You've got, um, and if you've got an adult bird, it'll do half of the heart symbol with you. You can, um, uh, the bird will hold hands with you. Uh, the bird will kind of shake itself and do a little dance. And that's an entire button. You put hats on the bird, including you can get a hat that turns your bird's head into a dog. Do not recommend. It's very frightening. <laughs> um, you can have uh, people give you special items that let you do weird stuff with a bird. Like the bird will draw a portrait of you and holding a bird. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, okay. Like this is supposed to be a game about colonialism and very smart bird. it's supposed to be about three to four and a half hours. But like. I'm definitely on track for about the four and a half hours because I just keep dicking around with this bird. Like, I can't stop just messing around with the bird. Um, I will also say that they know that this bird pet stuff is so compelling that they made an imprint mode, which makes it so that none of the enemies see you and will never attack you. So if you're a kid or you have a kid you want to play this game and you're okay with the kid learning to, like, murder the oppressors, uh, you can just go through and ignore the combat or do combat optional um, because they're pretty sure that you're just going to want to hang out with this bird. 
Mm, and it's That's true. Cool. I, I would say even in the like even in the full like non um non pacifist mode, one of the criticisms that I have of this game is that literally everything in it is optional. Um yeah. you can just sort of walk past the enemies and you're a fair bit faster than them. Uh so you can get right to whatever your objective is and complete your objective and then run away. Uh, well, sometimes they will problems. stab you in the face. <laughs> yes, yes, but you mostly can just walk around them and uh, the hunting and the cooking and all of that, like you don't, like you're, you're, you you can cook for your bird to like give him healing and stuff, but you don't really have to because if you pet the bird, it heals the bird. So, uh, you know, pretty much 75% of the game is is very optional. Hmm. Um, the um, But the, the biggest thing that I want to say about this game is that this is the game where I finally, absolutely got totally fed up with the Sony Move controllers. Mm. I have come around from thinking this was a okay thing for them to just sort of reuse this technology. Their Move controllers came out for the uh, iToy on like the God knows like the PS3. PS yeah, it was the three the, the PSI. Yeah. The iToy was the PS2. So yes, um, okay, that's what it is, and. These so these things were old technology that was already in uh, like junk bins at GameStop when they brought out the PSVR, and as controllers, they are so poorly suited to virtual reality. They don't have any way for you to move around. Like there's no joystick on them. Uh, the buttons are uh, not labeled in a way that you can feel tactilely uh, with a headset over your head. Um, they are just big, goofy, dorky, uh, chunky magic wand things that take up your whole hand and don't give you any sense of, don't give you the full sense of immersion that you want. They're impossible to keep properly charged. Um, they each have to have their own little tiny cord to charge them. And, you know, you're going to, you're going to use up more USB ports than your PlayStation has for sure. Trying to keep them charged. They are just such a garbage pile. So I have decided I will no longer use them. I'm going to play all my games with a with a uh, with a, a, a a normal controller, and if it do, if your game doesn't support normal controllers anymore, DualShock Four, I am sorry. I will no longer try your VR game. Except Beat Saber, play Beat Saber. Rant over. Play Beat Saber. That's Ooh. fair. Beat Saber is tight. So I, I will give a quick <laughs> uh, second to talk about the plot line of anti-colonialism because it is written by a couple folks I really admire. Uh, there's a Cassandra Kaw who wrote on Fall in London and Sun the Skies and Meg Giant who worked on 80 Days. And although you're not talking to people all the time, um, your bird doesn't talk or anything, hmm. I will say the writing is really nice. Um, they are you know, people of color. You've got your auntie who is just like this grizzled falcon hunter lady who's, she's not necessarily like sassy grandma, but she's just kind of mean to you. And it's like, no, you don't deserve to name your bird until you actually go fight some rebels or something like that. Um, so it's, there's a lot of little conversations. I also really do like the uh, NPC character who is just kind of wants to sleep and wants to leave you alone. Um, I will always be fond of a game with that. So it, it's rare that you get a game where you've got like, uh, a bird who can skateboard, but also someone is talking about how this place used to be a garden before the robots came. Um, it's a really odd pairing, and I'm always here for an odd pairing. I've heard good stuff, uh, particularly about the relationship with your your auntie in this game, like the the, the relationship between this like younger person who doesn't know a world before the colonizers came. Uh, you know, try to learning to have pride in her culture and and all that it sounded like a like a like much more compelling than the like bird in a cowboy hat box art is gonna like give you the impression of so um i'm i'm interested to play this game and the next time i have time to really dig in it, i think the thing that's prevented me from playing it is that i know this is a game that if i'm gonna play it i'm definitely gonna want to play it in vr and that's why i i I really, really wanted to play it when it came out, but I was waiting until I could possibly get my hands on a VR headset, and yeah. then Burbick was a good excuse to come back to it. And I'm glad I did, even without VR, but I, knowing that like the bird lands on your wrist to get that little haptic feedback, I, I can't imagine like how much that would add to this game. Yeah, totally. Well, before we move on to our, very, our next game, uh, let's get another exciting bird fact. Yeah, um, so bird fact... <laughs> 
so you know how pigeons when they walk they kind of look like bobbleheads moving their heads back and like back and forth yes uh, mm-hmm. with each mm-hmm. step so what they're doing there is so they have their eyes on either side of their head right and that lets them have a pretty good view of if there's any predators around but they don't have any depth perception because of that and so by moving their heads like this um then they're able to uh, see differences in apparent motion between nearby and distant objects. And so they're able to kind of create a depth map of the world by doing that uh, and compensate for this, uh, the way that their eyes are positioned. I see. Excellent. Fascinating. <laughs> really getting a bird's eye view. Oh, God. Oh, God. Of great, the world. Great, great bird fact. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> M- moving on. Next, <laughs> next game that we're talking about is Eagle Island. Now, this is one that I played a little bit of, but I think Nate also played it. So, Nate, why don't you tell us about Eagle Island? Sure. So, Eagle Island is a really interesting game and one that is definitely up my alley, so I was glad to pick it up. Um, It is an action platformer with roguelike elements, so that is, like, targeted right for me. Um, And basically, the, the core... Uh, element of the game is that you uh, play as I think his name is Quill. I'm t- terrible at remembering names, but he plays a character named Quill who has two owls and you land on you're on this island and this massive eagle comes and scoops up one of your owls and in the next frame you meet this guy's like, oh, he got snatched by the giant evil eagle. Here you go, adventurer. Go save. You have to go defeat the eagle and, and rescue your owl. It's like, why do I have to do it? You've just been sitting there waiting for someone else to walk up. But anyway, because that guy's owl was also taken. So he was just waiting, I guess, for someone else's owl to get taken uh, and, and send him on the quest. And you get this whole info dump. But anyway, uh, the way the game works is there's sort of a, an overworld um that you can traverse and then you enter into a dungeon essentially that is randomized it's a road you enter into a like roguelike encounter where uh you only you can only be hit three times and you have to make it all the way through and and uh complete it's almost like a temple if you will sort of like um or like a uh, uh, cadence of hyrule how we just did that right um you every time you enter into the uh, dungeon or temple or whatever it's totally new, and the main action of the game is that uh, Quill can only like run and jump, but your owl you can target and throw. Uh, so your goal, that's how you defeat enemies, is to throw the owl. And it has this combo system where when you f- aim the owl, your character actually freezes. So if you've jumped and you aim the owl, you freeze in midair, which is kind of a fun mechanic. Uh, it's kind of like um, like Breath of the Wild when you're in the air and you pull your bow. You know how time slows down. Yeah. It's kind of like that makes it easier to actually shoot. Uh, but you have a very small window, so you freeze for like two seconds. And then you use the joystick to throw the owl in the direction that you want. And if you hit something, you can press throw again and you refreeze. And so like the core sort of satisfying mechanic of this game is that you'll enter into a zone and there'll be like four enemies that are there and if you do it just right you can jump into the air freeze and ping pong your owl off of every single enemy in the map without ever touching the ground Uh, which is a really really fun and really really cool mechanic when it works Mm -hmm. (laughs) and and that's uh sort of the challenge of this game is that it's actually really hard to do most of the time uh it kind of requires almost like a perfect execution you can see you'll enter into a map and you'll enter like a screen and you can see there's like two evil birds or whatever going in a certain pattern and then two mushrooms that are below it and you know that if you can jump into the middle and throw your owl like hit the left one, hit the right one, hit the bottom one, hit the bottom one. You can hit all four before touching the ground. And the benefit of that is if you do, you get a heart, so you get your health back. The tricky part of that is that almost the 
100% of the time I got hurt as a player was when I was trying to do those combos. Yeah. And if I just played the game like really slowly and really methodically and just like cleared the room, I was way more successful. And then I would like make a mistake because I would kind of get sloppy and go fast. And then I would be like, okay, I got to pull off a combo to get my heart back. But they're so hard that most of the time that's what would actually kill me is I wouldn't I would I would get hurt once or twice just by playing the game. I'd be like, OK, I got to do a combo now, but you can only get hit three times and you don't really have like options of retrying it. So if you just fail and die, you get pulled out whole reset, you know, that that situation, that room that you were trying it with is not going to be there exactly like it was mm-hmm. before. So it can be kind of disappointing where you're like, oh, I want to like that mechanic. It feels when you pull it off, it feels really fun. It's like a um, almost like a bullet time thing, you know, where you're like, pow, 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 and you just like take out all these enemies. But the risk reward for it is really, really uh, low. It's high risk and low reward unless you need hearts, but you're also putting yourself in the most dangerous moment to lose hearts. Mm -hmm. So I found myself most of the time just trying to play really slow and and make my way through the game. Uh, There are some cool and interesting elements too about it that uh, add to the roguelike um, gameplay. You collect money or like little gems uh, after every enemy that you kill. And there will be chests that you can open and the chests give you a new ability or new like feature, new move set for just that run. And some of them are actually pretty like dramatic in how they change what you can do. Some of them are really simple, like you get an extra heart or your uh, owl does double damage. But some of them are like, now you can wall jump, which mm-hmm. actually, I mean, that's a pretty big like platformer movement type, right? Or one where uh, if you jump and you hit the ground and you jump again right after that, you jump at like three times the height, which was pretty fun. And and that would allow you to get into these positions that try these crazy combos and likely hurt yourself. Uh, so I really, really liked that element there. You're also collecting silver throughout the game, which there's a shop at like a checkpoint, which will let you pick out and choose the features that you want and you have four slots for these features. So you have to be kind of uh, selective with them. So um, I thought that was cool. It's pretty classic roguelike stuff, but like it really, I thought it worked for this game. So I ultimately really enjoyed the game, but it is hard to a degree that is sometimes less fun than what I normally like hard to be. Because the failure state can happen so suddenly, right? Yeah. Like, you know, like I feel like most of the most of the games that I like that are challenging roguelikes, it's like a you're being beat down until you lose, and like you know that like death is inevitable, and I the decisions I've made for this last run like have led me to this, like Slay the Spire, which we just did, like you you kind of know what led to you getting to where you are now. um, And now you've died. Whereas this game, it's like, Oh crap. I like goofed a single maneuver, which made me fall into a poison cloud and get hit by a bird and I'm done. And it all happened in like five seconds and my whole run is over. And I never had any ability to other than not make that one mistake, which I get it. Um, But it it, it made game like games would end very suddenly. And that didn't always feel great. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I do want to say, like, this game looks amazing. Like, the the mm-hmm. art on this is the kind of pixel art that I really love, that really feels like this, like, ultra uh, carefully done, like, really, uh, really lovingly illustrated uh, pixel art that looks like it's sort of from, like, the post-retro game era. So it's, it's like, I would say, like, if this is, like, this is, like, um, I, I always like to compare things like this to, like, like the, if they'd really kept making great 2D games on the Saturn or something, you might have looked like this. Like it's that great yeah. like 32 bit, not 16 bit kind of style with like large, colorful characters, lots of details in the sprites. Um, the the art here is great. I think this is actually the work of a, a single developer. I may be wrong about yeah. that, but I, I like this is clearly like a labor of love. I think that also sometimes is how you get into these situations where somebody produces a game that's like super polished 
clearly has a lot of love and heart poured into every element of it and is also so hard that it puts people off. And it's because this guy has probably played his game so much that it doesn't seem that hard to him. But oh boy, it seems hard to me. This game's gotten like solid seven out of tens because I think like me and like you, I I think most people come to this game thinking like, wow, this looks amazing. And even if you really like sort of rogue light style uh, action platformers, um, you might find that this one has some design elements that are just a little bit too to on the punishing side and can leave you feeling a little bit frustrated. And uh, they have said, though, that the thing that I do find kind of promising about this, though, is that this mo- this game came out pretty recently and the developer has done a number of updates to it since it came out um, to kind of address that stuff. So um, the main one here is that if you look on the Steam page, he has an art uh, has a post pretty recently about a mode he's adding to the game. I believe it's in beta on Steam right now, and it's coming to the Switch version eventually too, um, that he's calling light mode. And he's made a couple of tweaks. And I think this is all the game would need to be a really, really, really good experience. The main tweak that he's making is he's keeping the combo system, but changing it to you get a heart if you do a combo of three rather than a combo of four. And it's like, that would tilt this game so much like tilt me so far in favor of this game. Like I, I, I could not pull off four combos. I was pulling off three combos just often enough to feel like, Hmm, this is good. Okay. I could do those. Um, so I think it would make the game quite a bit easier, but I think that's what this game needs. It's also changing. There's uh, going to be hearts available in, in chests and there might be more checkpoints. I think, um, some other, other things that are changing about the game. And I think that's really all this game needs to be a really, really fun, cool game. The, the art is great. He's doing this really cool um, lighting effects on the p- pixel art. I, you don't see a lot of games do that, but there's like real-time lighting effects that have like really dramatic, interesting effects on the on the sprite art. It look, looks great. Um, like it, it's just an appealing game. I'll say that I was turned off by watching a streamer who plays video games all day for a living have so much trouble with this game. I mean, he was still pretty good, but like he was having trouble getting four combos. So I'm really excited that they're making a light version because I saw that streamer struggling and just was like, not for me. So this means I might actually be able to pick it up because the mechanic seems so cool and it looks so sweet. The problem with the four combo is that a lot of rooms, it's not even an option. Just mm-hmm. there's only there's only a couple bad guys like there's literally or they're just spaced four. out in such a way that the, depending on yeah. how they're positioned, it's just impossible to do a combo. Yeah, right. So you kind of have these rare occasions where it's like, OK, I can see the perfect I, I, I know how to do this and then you have to do it. And then because failure you have such low health and you're probably low. The yeah, you reason you're probably trying it most of the time before you. Yeah. You're, and the whole reason you're probably even trying the combo is because you're low on health. You don't need to do it if you have full yeah. health. Right. Which is why generally going slow uh, was like a better strategy than trying to do that. So you're it, it's like rare enough where it's not you don't get enough practice at it. Um, so I do think reducing it would make sense. I do think like, this is a game that similar to what you all are about to talk with a short hike that this is a complete enough game that I think we probably could have done as a full episode and talked a lot about the design and the different levels and all of that. So yeah, the bosses, it's got some really incredible looking. Yeah, Um, it's a really cool game and it definitely accomplishes a lot and it's very interesting. And I like the sort of overworld with uh roguelike dungeons um there's a lot that i really really liked about this game i just i think some of the incentives of the fun part of the game don't match um like how what am i trying to say i think it incentivizes you to do combos but makes them rare and hard enough that they're not fun unless you nail it so uh, I think some tweaking with that would make it a really, really fun game. Yeah, and I'm I'm looking forward to checking this out. Um, I think once that update comes to the Switch version, I'll probably pick it up because I I always like games like yeah. this on the Switch. You know, I like 2D platformers on the Switch. It's what I like. And oh, and I'll also mention that there is a demo. Um, and that is you know because this is one of those games that maybe it's hit hits for you and maybe it doesn't. Uh, download the demo. It's on Steam, or you can find the demo also on itch.io. Um, so, uh, you know, download it, play it. The demo is on PC and Mac and Linux, as is the game itself. Um, I don't think there's a demo for the Switch, but the full game is available on Switch. So, um, and it's uh, $19.99. So, uh, I think this may be our last bird fact for the episode. So make it good. (laughs) 
All right. So bird facts. Birds make sound, uh, at least songbirds make sound with a different anatomy than people. Um, and uh, we use a larynx. Birds have a larynx too, but uh, what they use for making sound is called a syrinx. And instead of being able to make, having one pathway uh, from the lungs going up to, uh, through the throat to be able to produce sound, it has two pathways and they're able to make two different pitches with it. And so with birds like a thrush, then you can hear them making, uh, being able to sing multiple notes at a time. And it's creates this really haunting eerie effect. Um, and especially then there's a bird called the Kokako bird in New Zealand. And it sounds absolutely insane. Um, I'll send you sound files to please do. In, uh, Cause I otherwise this is just going to sound ridiculous. <laughs> But yeah, uh, they are super cool to listen to um, and uh, definitely are some of the wilder bird calls out there. <laughs> awesome. I, I'm, I'm looking forward wow. to uh, dropping that audio into our I don't think I've ever edited bird sounds into the episode before. <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking forward to that adventure. Something I think Mark has done many times. You know, I, I suspect you're right. <laughs> there was that awesome story about the the golf company or the golf tournament that was editing in oh, yeah. bird sounds into the background of their uh, broadcast yeah when, yeah when you're watching a golf uh someone play golf on tv then like there's not a whole lot of sound actually happening yeah so they want to have less dead air well and i just love that i know they got caught because some bird fan a birder called them out for using the wrong sound for these like a bird yeah. that didn't <laughs> that didn't exist in that area and that's <laughs> yeah, how they exactly. got called uh, excuse me birds don't play golf <laughs> <laughs> yeah. quick dark bird story that reagan will probably cut out um so i went to the houston livestock show and rodeo uh and there was a section where you're supposed to go see baby birds and i was with uh my nephew who was just short enough and not good enough at reading um, and I heard the sounds of like little chirping. I was like, let's go see the the baby chicks. And I went to the display and it was all like stuffed animal baby chicks and they were playing the sound of chirping. Uh, and I was, I was like, what's going on? And I read the sign. It was like, there was an outbreak and like the baby birds basically had all died, oh, but they still, no. they'd reserved the space for the baby chicks. So the, the kid, my nephew was like, pick me up, pick me up. I want to see the, the birds. And I was like, uh, here, I turned around. I was like, look at the adult chickens. <laughs> nice. And we just walked past. So the only time I've heard fake bird calls was because they were trying to disguise the fact that all yeah. the baby chicks were dead at the rodeo. Oh man. The, the Houston livestock show and rodeo is just like a, a like a hall of horrors for, for like mm. chicken lovers that, I remember when I was a kid, I went, oh, maybe I wasn't even a kid. I think I was, I think I was like in college and I went and there was a, uh, there was a mural. So, such a difference. It's I know. Like, okay. But, I was a kid or I was in college. Well, th there was this mural there that showed the process of preparing poultry and it had these oh, cartoon, yeah. oh, cartoon no. chickens. No, no, no. That were going through a machine and it was like, this is the step where it separates out the, the male chicks and they're processed. And it was like a grinder and these little cartoon chickens going through a grinder. Like, oh boy, kids it's, enjoy. Yeah, that there's a reason there are not meat processing plant games other than I guess Edith Finch. Mm, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is Edith Finch a bird game? Mm -mm. Mm. Wow. I don't think so. There's that part where you play as a bird. There is a chapter where you play as a bird, isn't there? I mean, you turn into different animals, but you do turn into a bird during that game. Yeah. Well, I'm yeah. saying more because the, her name the, is the Finch. title. Also, yeah. Yeah. also it's, yeah. it's a much lazier joke than that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Reagan, you went way past what Shane was talking was uh, joking about. Yep. Uh, that's what I do. Uh, so next game we are talking about, and this will be the last game for the episode. And also, in a way, I'm really glad that we played this one. And I almost, almost wish that we had saved this to do a separate episode on it because it is such a short game game. Like it's it's really up our alley. So this might be my top recommend of the episode. Uh, and that's a short hike. It just came out a couple of days ago. I think it came out on July 30th, if you're uh, yep. listening. So uh, it's out on uh, 
uh, itch.io and Steam. Um, and I think it's pretty inexpensive on those platforms. I forget how much it yeah, was, it's, but it's about seven bucks right now. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So, and uh, about 90 minutes. And my pitch for it is basically that it is like, uh, it's like a side story in the Night in the Woods uh, universe. You're playing as a bird girl named Claire. Um, the, the game opens with a shot of Claire and what I, what I think we determine later her is aunt. her aunt. Yeah. Um, in a car on the way to a provincial park for a camping trip. And they've rented a cottage. They're going to gonna stay at this, this, uh, this park that presumably they've been to before. Um, and, uh, and Claire... Uh, the, the most of the game, the game truly begins when Claire leaves the cottage to go sort of wander around the park uh, to clear her head. Something's clearly going on with Claire and uh, she needs she needs some space. She needs to clear her head, take a walk, take a short hike. Um, and more importantly, she needs cell reception. Oh, yes. Which is of not course. available anywhere on the island other than at the very peak of the mountain. Yes. It's not usually how it works, but sure. <laughs> yeah. So she's going to climb a uh, Hawk Peak, Hawk Point Peak, Hawk, Hawk Peak. Yeah. Uh, in, Hawk Peak. Yes. In order to get cell reception. Um, and uh, ultimately, it's got kind of two parts to it that I think are, are interesting. One is that it's got a kind of an Animal Crossing vibe where you're wandering around yeah. the, the park and talking to all the various animal people and all of them have their their deal. Right. So all you know, there's the person who's preparing for the for the the foot race. There's the person who runs the campgrounds. There's the you know, everybody's got their their deal. There's the one who wants you to collect shells for them for no apparent reason. The guy whose uh, camping permit was eaten by a fish. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and all of them have some little thing that you could do for them in a very sort of adventure gamey kind of way, but all of them are charming. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wanted to talk to each and every one of these little characters and I, uh, I wanted to do whatever their little menial task was for them because they were cute and interesting to talk to. Um, but the other aspect of the game is the climbing of the mountain and it's actually got more mechanics to it than I expected. So the, the big part of it is that you are trying to level up your stamina in a very breath of the wild kind of way by collecting golden feathers. And the golden feathers let you do two things. Uh, one is they let you climb. You know, if you just sort of walk up to a vertical surface, you can shimmy up it. And, uh, you know, depending on how many golden feathers you have, you can climb taller and taller surfaces. And the other thing that they let you do is do a glide, a kind of a jump glide where you can fly down. I mentioned that the character, the main character, Claire, is a bird, right? I, I hope I did. Uh, <laughs> yes, I don't think you did. Actually. Okay, if I didn't, now you now you know why well, we it's Bird it. Week. Everyone's a bird in this. Yeah, so. Claire is a bird. I assumed because it's Bird Week, but yeah. I don't think we explicitly. We're all it. birds here. Yeah. <laughs> so Claire's a bird, and uh, and she can fly, but mostly just downward, right? Um, but the more golden feathers you acquire, the more sort of jumpy flaps you can do and the longer you can glide. Um, so you're going around doing favors for folks or otherwise exploring this island in order to uh, find or acquire more uh, golden feathers to be able to climb ever higher on the mountain. I found this game super satisfying, uh, like yeah. super... The, the whole process was super satisfying. And I guess the, the number one thing about it that I think is like an absolute win, like an absolute joy and, and success is that the, the whole purpose of this game is to be able to climb to higher places, right? To, to climb the mountain. And the mountain gets progressively more difficult to climb. In fact, the higher you go, it starts layering on more mechanics, like, like it's freezing cold up there and it starts freezing some of your golden feathers, things like that. Um, you're climbing ever higher. Um, but as you do that, the whole game takes place on this extremely well-realized 3D mountain island. And no matter where you climb, you're always seeing things off in the distance that are interesting that you want to go check out. There's always some little thing for you to go grab. Maybe it's coins that you can use to buy more feathers. Maybe there's a feather hanging out someplace that might be difficult to climb to. There's always little things. Or maybe there's a person you didn't see and you want to go talk to them. There's always little things all these little like, or, you know, little, little new landscape elements. Like there's a, there's a, you know, a hidden um, like cave that you can go into, or you find a, a graveyard on the back of the Island. And so it's always encouraging you to climb, but it's also 
always encouraging you to explore and to divert from your straight up climb to go and check out new stuff. And it always pays off in some way because there's always little things to find, either people or new feathers or other stuff like that. And it has this sort of back and forth to the climbing of like, obviously you want to climb as far as you can, but ultimately you'll hit your limit. It gets harder and harder to climb and then you'll have to fly down. And the flying is the best part of this game because you're, you know, you're constantly climbing up and gliding back down. And that glide is satisfying to do. And as you're doing it, you're always gliding over parts of the terrain that you haven't seen before and that you can go and spot those new things and, and find stuff that you, you might've missed. So the constant sort of back and forth of like, oh, I can climb a little higher now. Wow. I found something really cool, but I guess I can't climb any farther. Let me glide back down. Oh, cool. I found something while I was gliding back down. This whole back and forth of it is just so, so, uh, satisfying to explore this Island. And it's also just like a really sweet game in terms of its story. Like I, I just had a lovely time with this game. Mark, what did you think of, uh, of like the, the, the whole thing? What, what, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, uh, I thought it was super fun. Um, the it really does have animal crossing vibes uh and the it's something where the it it took me about an hour and a half as well to get through the kind of end of the game um but it's definitely the kind of game where it leaves you it leaves you wanting more um and uh so after that then i went and played a bunch more hours getting the, <laughs> getting in all the filling in all the little side things that i had skipped or had missed the first time mm -hmm. um and you know you can fish and collecting all the different fish or uh finishing up any uh little side quests that you don't need to finish to be able to uh get to the final sequence um and like getting to hear all the different things and the stories of the other people camping and exploring this um uh this island is super fun um i thought the writing was really charming uh and silly um in a way that is really endearing yeah and it had an ending that obviously i won't spoil here but i found really sweet right. like uh it, it, yeah. it does have like a really satisfying conclusion um and i mean i don't think it's too much of a uh too much of a spoiler to say that the ending is you getting to the top of the mountain <laughs> um because it is about climbing this mountain and just the feeling of of getting to the top of that mountain, this game is nothing like Celeste. But that moment had a little bit of that like triumphant, I finally got to the top vibe that Celeste had. And in a, in a way that's almost similar to Celeste, but a little different here and maybe even more satisfying is that obviously, you know, once you've climbed to the very, very top of this mountain, then you get to glide down and you get the longest, most satisfying flight of the whole game is that that final moment. It's just just a joy. So I I a hundred percent recommend this game. I I would I would say this is like one of the, I mean I I can't believe that we saved such a good game for for a goofy one off Bird Week episode. But I'm also really glad <laughs> that we got a chance to talk about it. I don't know how much more I would I, mean, I could probably fill more time with a short hike. But here we are, uh, you know, a little over an hour into our Bird Week episode. I, I, do you have anything else you want to say about uh, about a short hike? I mean, I guess oh, I, I'd say the music is good. We didn't mention that it's got yeah. great music. Um, and, uh, this is mostly the work of a solo developer, Adam, Adam Robinson. You, uh, he worked with a, with a musician whose name I don't have handy, but also did a great job, but like really a great project for a solo developer. Like, wow, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I, and for me, this is just so perfectly up my alley where it was like, this is the, one of my favorite things that I played in a little while. So I, yeah. uh, I highly recommend it. Um, and uh, as with the best of any short game, it's something where it ends and it's just like, oh man, I wish, I wish there was more because it's, it's, it's something where, uh, like this was so fun. I wish it could continue in a way, but yeah, just where would you say right that the, like, it does really well in terms of like authenticity to actual birds and where is it not <laughs> so good? <laughs> um, you know, it doesn't make any specific claims, I think as to what kind of bird Claire is. I, um, I think so. it's pretty clear that she is one of the blackbird enemies from Monument Valley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I whatever whatever kind of bird that is, it's something where there's it's it's very much just like generic bird where it kind of looks penguinish, but it's not, and it's it's some kind of songbird. 
you know, uh, it's, I'm going to say it's not a, not passing the test of, you're, uh, you're not instilling knowledge. a lot of confidence in your bird knowledge here. I'm, I'm a little worried. <laughs> well, honestly, I think this is considering the bird is talking to people. This might be the least realistic of this round, which is yeah. astonishing because it's more realistic than literally every bird we had in the last bird week. <laughs> you, you think this is you think this is less less uh, less realistic than the game where you use your bird as a projectile to fight dragons? <laughs> mm. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. Okay. I, they we're putting our stake in it there. That's that's good. So this has made me very happy. I always enjoy doing bird week. Our our very frequent tradition that we've done once since 2016. Hopefully, we'll do another bird week again soon. May it live forever. <laughs> the second biannual try <laughs> every third year <laughs> bird yeah, week. Exactly. Um, so I'm so glad that we finally got together and did another bird week episode. Uh, listeners, if you have any bird themed games that you think we missed, we are always keeping a list for the next bird week. So let us know. Um, and if you have a, if you want to hear more cool bird facts um, presented in a way that's much better than me kind of rambling them out. Uh, listen to Bird Note. It's a minute and 45 seconds of bird facts and cool things about birds uh, every single day. So yeah, subscribe. I have to go to it. I, I find it very relaxing. <laughs> there is a real niche for very short podcasts like Bird Note. Oh, like you can, that's you know, what I was just thinking. Put that in your podcast yeah. app and have it play, you know, in between literally any other podcasts and it will bring you tiny amounts of joy. It's great. If you like uh, short video games, you might like short podcasts. You, so. okay. <laughs> if you, if you like this not. podcast, you obviously don't like short podcasts, right? <laughs> yeah, right. We are a podcast that's longer than the, the uh, games topics we play. that we have. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> but uh, this this has made me very happy. And so listeners of the to this show, of course, know that we usually end our program with a segment we like to call What's Making Us Happy This Week. So I'll start with Laura. Laura, what's making you happy this week? So I am not happy that Jane the Virgin is over, but I am extraordinarily happy that it ended on its own terms and had such a great final season. So the 100th episode, Chapter 100, uh, aired last night. I binged a bunch of episodes uh, on a resident trip to Frankfurt to catch up, and uh, it is just delightfully warm. Uh, If you haven't watched it because you think it is a silly telenovela, it is a telenovela, yes, but it is not silly. It is very, it takes things very seriously. Um, but it has such a huge heart. Like say, it is silly, weird things but will it's happen, silly, and then it's like purposefully well, silly. Exactly, really silly things happen, and people react to them as if they're realistic, and it's great. So, if you never thought it was your bag, give it a try. Um, it's unlike anything else on TV, and it will be really hard to replace. I feel like a lot of my really weird ladies on TV are all going away this year. Um, if you work in television, maybe think about giving some of these wonderful people jobs because <laughs> Jane the Virgin is great. Uh, at least I have 100 episodes to go back to next time I'm sad and need to pick me up. I work with someone named Rogelio and all, <sighs> all I can think of still is Rogelio from Jane the Virgin. <laughs> Rogelio de la Vega. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. Shane, what's making you happy this week? This week I've had not a ton of uh, free time outside of, you know, a, a few hours, which I diverted devoted to this bird game. But um, we have, as you know, been playing a bunch of this RPG tactics sim life uh, tea party simulator game, um, Fire Emblem Three Houses. I was about to get that name wrong. Um, and... For whatever reason, that gave me the bug to start drawing uh, maps for my RPG campaign. So I, I spent a good couple of hours this week um, pulling out my old gigantic uh, vinyl mats and pre-drawing a whole bunch of Fire Emblem-inspired uh, battle maps and city maps. And there's just something incredibly zen for me about um, trying to draw out some kind of trying to plan some kind of potential scenario uh putting on my dungeon master hat and trying to like design 
uh, a little bit of a game scenario for myself. So that that has been making me happy, and I am uh, uh, I am I've been experimenting with lots of new colors of marker as I do this. So really, really putting my uh, my uh, uh, coloring, uh, stealing my toddler's markers is essentially what I'm doing, and uh, and so it's all it's all been keeping me pretty well entertained. So it's not a big. Um, it's no media recommendation like I like to give uh, for the segment of the show, but it is definitely the thing that's been bringing me a little bit of joy. That's awesome. And the thing that's been making me happy is also Fire Emblem related, uh, and it is Bernadetta. So if you haven't played Fire Emblem before, uh, one of the previous games, they uh, they didn't used to be, but after the 3DS one um, uh, awakening, they've become really uh, life simmy and a big part of that is like just trying really hard to get you to fall in love with these characters, right? And the, by by telling you little stories involving all of the characters are all painted with very broad, slightly anime tinted brushes, right? But they're they're so they're all a bit cliche, but some of them are really lovable. And um, I I have just I've really really been enjoying Fire Emblem Three Houses this week. Uh, I've put like twelve hours into it in a week, which is something I don't usually get to do with a game. Um, please developers of RPGs put your game on switch. That is the only way I will ever finish them. I have to be able to play them on the toilet in bed, all of the places, uh, the two places, the two places, the, toilet. the two places, <laughs> the only two places to just play. Just like Nintendo games. always envisioned all those commercials, just like the switch was meant to be. Played. They were like at parties with your friends on the toilet. <laughs> if they were being honest, it would all be toilet. Um, there's the game is great. And uh, Bernadetta is a character. She's in the Black Eagle house, the house that everyone should choose because they rule. Black Eagles rule. And um, and Bernadetta, her whole deal is that she does not like to leave her room. Very much understand you, Bernadetta. Um, so she's she's uh, she's got social anxiety and she's like doesn't like being, uh, you know, in, doesn't like interacting with people. Somehow she's at this school for child soldiers, which is the whole story of the uh, of of the the Fire Emblem series. You are a professor who's teaching a bunch of child soldiers to go die, right? Um, cool. But uh, but turns out, of course, because this is Fire Emblem, that Bernadetta's uh, absolutely a beast with a bow, and I'm also working on uh, lance and horse skills with Bernadetta. And you know, some of these characters, it's like, oh, you know, you're you're the cocky young knight. You want to kill people with a sword. I'm like, I don't, I don't care, but there's something really great about taking the, the, uh, the shrinking violet and turning her into an absolute killing machine that I find incredibly satisfying. Um, so Bernadetta is making me very happy this week. And if you're not playing the black Eagles, I highly recommend recruiting Bernadetta. Um, and if you are playing fire emblem, uh, and are not yet one of our patrons on Patreon. We've been having a very lively discussion. So really, maybe the thing that's been making me most happy this week is the lively discussion of Fire Emblem Three Houses that's been going on in our Discord. It's been great to have a place to talk about that game as I'm playing it. It's the kind of game where there's lots of little secrets. There's lots of poorly explained systems that require some digging into menus and things to understand. That's just sort of the nature of these sorts of games. Um, but having a kind of a support group to be able to chit chat with as I'm going through it has made a lot of difference. So 100%, if you are playing the game and are interested in chatting with me and other folks who are really, really deep into Fire Emblem right now, join us on our Discord. Anybody at $1 or more on our Patreon gets access. So please join us there. Nate, what's making you happy this week? Yeah, so uh, Molly and I just watched a uh, little bit late to it, but not like not as late as I am normally to things. Uh, <laughs> just finished the third season of Stranger Things, and it was interesting because the first couple of episodes I wasn't super into it, uh, and then uh, it was Molly said something that kind of reframed how I was viewing it. It was basically you know the first two seasons were children, right? And the whole thing was like a, an homage to the, the 80s children thrillers, uh, E.T., mm -hmm. Goonies, and things like that. Well, now the kids, are, they're not kids anymore, right? They're like like teenagers or they're all like double the height of what they were when the show started. And the show clearly made a decision to also progress like the homage that they were going for more into the... Uh, like action-packed teenage 
movies of the 80s mm. and get away from more of like the subtlety uh, stuff <laughs> of E.T. Okay. Uh, and so like Terminator and things like that where like the main characters are like teenagers and not children. So the stakes are going to be a little bit higher and like the violence is going to be higher. And through that lens uh, and just the action plot gets better and better. I ended up really, really enjoying this season. Uh, it's campy and goofy and like 20% of the time I'm going like, that's stupid. Uh, <laughs> but 80% of the time I was like, this is over the top and fun. Uh, there's a ton of great like mall stuff that if you spent time in malls uh, when you were younger, you're like, oh man, that's all I ever wanted to do was do what they're doing in a mall right now, uh, which is fighting monsters. So uh, I don't know. I, I, it was a interesting progression where I really thought it had gone stupid. <laughs> and then by the end, I'm like, yes, what a beautiful, what a smart turn. And I hope that they continue the show. Well, I actually kind of hope that this is the last season, but that's plot purposes. It probably won't be. Um, but if they continue the show, I'm really inter- interested to see if the seasons start to become more like thematic to a certain style of movie and not just purely like slow uh, early 80s kids adventure mm. shows. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. I'm really excited that you, because I also bounced off of it. I watched an episode or two and was like, eh, this doesn't feel great. Uh, I was a huge fan of Nerdy Steve, but I oh, yeah. wanted more from the show. So I'm really glad that uh, I should. Keep going, keep going. I mean, so part of it, the first couple episodes also, I think sort of what they're dealing with is not the the most interesting. They're really hard, like leaning into like the teenage romance part of it. And that is not as interesting once the actual action plot steps up and they kind of become way more like superheroes than they ever were before. And, and Harper or Hopper. Yeah. Uh, Hopper. Hopper, right. like he literally gets called Fat Rambo later in the show. So spoilers, <laughs> but like that's what it gets closer to than uh, than maybe the earlier, the first two seasons. And it's it's really really enjoyable, especially if you like like stupid action stuff. You know, like over the top action movies or shows. I'm really into that. So uh, yeah. yeah, awesome. I, I was more it. into the exploding rats than the kids making out with each other. So like. Yeah, well, you get way more of that. The uh, the <laughs> gross exploding rats, it only gets bigger and grosser. Uh, That's so really good to hear. I, I, I've been holding off on watching that season. I don't know. It just hasn't been. I haven't had time to, to dig into it yet, I, but uh, I'm looking forward to it now. That's really great. Yeah, check it out. Yeah, um, yeah. Mark, what is making you happy this week? Yeah, um, so I used to enjoy doing like woodworking stuff while I was in high school and just building and small things. I wasn't particularly good at it, but I like doing it. Um, but I haven't done anything with that for five, six, something like that years now. Um, and I've been wanting to get back into it, but just haven't really had either the space or the tools or the project to do that. Um, and I just finally kind of found the right thing to work on. That was simple enough to uh, really, be hard to mess up <laughs> hmm. um we're just building some shelves to go in the house um and uh then it's been really fun just getting to you know work on making something precise and look good um putting that together um and just kind of refamiliarize myself with uh, the various tools and stuff so that's been super satisfying um and then at the end of the day then you have a thing that uh you've created from all of that that uh makes your home better uh, permanently, which is really cool. So um, that's been definitely a nice outlet and a fun thing to be working on lately. That's awesome. I haven't had to, I haven't had tools around in, a, in long enough that I don't even know how I would begin with something like that. Yeah, I had to, I had to buy a circular saw. Um, I used my dad's tools while I was in high school or um, while in college had access to various like, engineering workshops or things like that and just kind of snuck in to use their tools that's so good this is this is it's like all right what is, what are some of the cheap entry level tools i can get as a investment and just kind of work up from there as projects call for it and uh 
this is totally enough for for one project and uh yeah and then just thinking of what i'll do next awesome that's that's very that's very cool and the kind of kind of thing that like oh that's 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 much more productive than any of my hobbies so (laughs) So congratulations (laughs) yeah i haven't been able to do that stuff since like working in the uh, set and prop shops in college and i'm like i learned all this stuff like welding that I have not used. Right? Since. Yeah. Like, because where am I going to, I can't weld in my apartment. <laughs> so I'm really glad you can woodwork. Like shelves are imminently practical. Yeah. 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 Uh, theater word. I, I also did uh theater workshop stuff and theater workshop gets you really good at like making things that look like what you want it to look like from 20 feet away. And yeah. Real unsafe. <laughs> you can yeah. build really, you, know? you can well, that's the thing. do really good one sided walls. That's, that's yeah. all you get. We we might be task rabbiting, um, hanging up our projection screen because we don't have the right drill. And my husband was like, you, what, what are you talking about? Like you use drills all the time. And it was like, yeah, for like disposable stuff, no one could stand on. <laughs> like, yeah. And if you mess it up, you just like put a little paint over it and just like go yeah. to the right of it. Yeah. I did know how to get a screw out of the wall, but that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. thank you. So first of all, Mark, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's always, a, it's always fun to have you on and we're always looking for excuses. So, uh, you know, any, anytime yeah. something tangentially relates to, uh, to, uh, I don't know, Apple stuff or birds. We'll have you on again and we'll figure out some other <laughs> you're excuses an, eventually too. Yeah, no, it's the, I, you're an excellent wingman. Oh, hey. yeah. <laughs> um, bird puns normally, too uh, can broad- play at that game. <laughs> oh gosh. No egrets. <laughs> yeah. The, I know I'm normally brought in as the Apple guy, but uh, glad that I wasn't pigeonholed this time. So <laughs> it's, oh. it's, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again for coming on. And of course you could, uh, <laughs> Well, uh, before we uh, do our admin and outro, I want to thank our patrons. If you are a patron of this show, thank you for your support. It really means a lot to us. And we also have very much enjoyed getting to know all of you via the Discord recently. It's just been a real bright spot in the last couple of weeks for me to to chit chat with folks about games and whatever else is on everybody's mind. Uh, It's just just been an exciting thing. Uh, and if you want to join that discord and join our circle of support, you can go to patreon.com slash the short game, or of course you can go to our website and click the Patreon link at the top. Um, and uh, supporters at a dollar a month level or higher, uh, which is all of you, if you support us, uh, will get access to our discord. Uh, we also have a inner circle, what we call the short list for folks who support us at the $5 a month level or higher. Um, we actually have plans for that. At the moment, it's mostly just bragging rights and our deep and <laughs> heartfelt thanks uh, to all of the folks in on the short list. But we are planning things that, we're go- that are going to be exclusive to short list patrons. So if you are interested or if you have ideas about what those things should be, <laughs> that's also useful information to us. So join our Patreon and let us know what those are. Um, this is really how you monetize. You say, give us money. Um, the more, the better. <laughs> uh, if you uh, donate at the $7 level, Reagan will get a face tattoo of your name. I am. That is a promise. I'm getting right out ahead of this one and saying no. Um, but thank you so much to all of our patrons. We really appreciate the support. Uh, if you, uh, whether you're a patron or not, you can find our show on the internet at www.theshortgame.net where you'll find our contact form. That's another great way, in addition to the Discord, to letting us know what sorts of short games you think are interesting or should be covered. Or you can email us at info at theshortgame.net or you can find our show on Twitter at underscore short game. You can also, of course, find us on Apple Podcasts and all the podcast players. And if you haven't, uh, leave us a review. We really appreciate those. It means a lot to the show and also helps folks find us. Uh, And uh, you can find me on Twitter at Reagan K. That's R-A-Y-G-A-N-K. So first, Mark, where can people find you and all of your work? Yeah, uh, you can find me on Twitter at M.C. Bramhill. Uh, and uh, you can find the work that I'm doing right now at birdnote.org. Mm. And of course, also uh, the Welcome to Macintosh podcast, which is not currently airing, but has an amazing back catalog. If you're into tech, he's got some really great stories there. And that is, I think, macintosh.fm, right? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. So both great shows. Highly recommend both. Uh, Laura, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Laura J. Nash. Nate, where can people find you? 
on Twitter at Nate STL. And Shane, where can people find you? Over on the Twitter at 8BitShane. And listeners, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of The Short Game. Can we get one more bird fact from... Oh, uh, <laughs> yes. Please. You want one? Okay. Let me... One get... more. One more outro Bonus. bird fact. For the, for, the, <clears throat> for the real fans. Someone, for the people um, who made it all the way to the end. And this one, I, this one, uh, I enjoy a lot, uh, that just, uh, so parrots are able to mimic human speech, right? Um, but you can, they can mimic the various sounds, but some of those sounds are made using lips, which are not a thing that birds have. <laughs> Thank God. Um, and so making a sound like a, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> for a real, um, it's a great that fact. That would make eagle uh, flight so much more disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, the 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 sounds like a p or b, then they can't they can't make the sounds of p's or b's, um, and so instead they kind of have to like essentially it's like burping um, a sound where they're doing that to make to approximate what we do, um, which just I think is hilarious. Um, so <laughs> it's also pretty incredible that they are like creating sounds, right? So like they're like. I can't do it with how I normally talk. So now I have to make, I have to burp it because it's very important that I speak like a human. That's crazy. Yeah. It's more precisely. It is uh, esophageal speech. Uh-huh. Is, um, <laughs> Thank you. I, I will never hear the phrase Polly wants a cracker without thinking yeah. about the bird burping. Oh, gross. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, that is an excellent, excellent bird fact. Thank you once again, Mark, for joining us. And listeners, thank you so much for joining us on this very special episode of The Short Game. Caw! <laughs>